please take your seats. We will begin. Please take your seats and we will begin. Please turn to song 147. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Song 147. Song 147. <laughs> Song 158, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Song 158. <laughs>
right soul winning time. Those meet right here. All you have to do is just show up here at that time and go soul winning. And then the North Phoenix soul winning, you just show up at the North Phoenix location and go soul winning. But with the regional soul winning groups, you meet out in the field. So be sure to get with those leaders. Below that, we have a list of, or I'm sorry, we have the salvation and baptism statistics. Does anybody here need to be baptized today? Come see me after the service. We'll see Brother Garrett after the service, and we'll get you baptized uh, this morning. We'll have the water set up, the, the, the towels, the change of clothes, everything like that. And then across the page, big news for Brother Garrett, the babies were born. Caleb and Joshua are here.
that all the other groups had a similar experience to what I had. So we told that one group, hey, go back to the same place, but everybody else, go somewhere different. You know, just find something that looks good. So I went and I found just the worst ghetto that I could find. I mean, it was just rough. It was, it was just horrible. You know, I had to keep setting my, my old sister Ronnie. I had to set her mind at ease a little bit. Then why were you there? <laughs> and even that was unreceptive. I know, you know, so anyway. But you know what I take away from this is that even when you go to a place that's pretty unreceptive, you can still get 85 people saved. Amen. And if you have 99 soul winners that work their tails off the whole day, and you just keep going through those rejections and keep going through those rejections, it works. And, and look, soul winning works everywhere. We've never had a soul winning marathon where we went there and it was a complete bust. It has never happened. Because if you put enough man hours into soul winning, you will get people saved. Amen. No matter where, it doesn't matter if you're in Maine or Boston or Atlanta, Washington, D.C., Albuquerque, Portland, everywhere we've gone, we've had a lot of people. And so, uh, anyway, thank you so much to everybody who uh, made the trip out there. And I will say one great thing about Albuquerque. The scenery was beautiful. I mean, especially the drive there was just breathtaking. I mean, the only entertainment you really needed was just looking out the window. I mean, the, the breathtaking uh, scenery on the way there and back. And also, the weather was perfect. Right. I mean, it was quite a bit cooler than here. And it was, but it was still nice and warm, so it was like a perfect weather. So uh, thank you to everybody. We had a great time. and really appreciate everybody's participation with that. Below that also, there's a note that says that the newly released books of Thessalonians DVD set are available for the taking on the back bookcase in the back of the auditorium. It's basically just like the Revelation series, but instead of those 22 chapters, it's the eight chapters of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. So that's back there. Be sure to take one for yourself. Share it with somebody that's, that's interested in that. And then another thing that we've got back there newly available is our hymn disc five. It's a new music CD of hymns that we just finished. And out of all of the music CDs, this one is by far my favorite one, volume five. So be sure to grab one of these, pop it in the car on your way out. And then uh, everything's free back there. There's not even a donation box or anything. It's just just take it. That's what it's for. We want to get the stuff in people's hands. So don't be shy about taking that stuff back there. And then below that, we've got the memory verse. We're still working on learning Psalm 93. And then below that, just another list of things that are coming up. July 4th, we've got Babylon USA playing in uh, Super Saver Cinemas 8 in North Phoenix. I believe it's around Bell Road and the 17th. All right. Somewhere. Bell and 17th, somewhere right around there. And then uh, we've got the soul winning trip to Hermosillo, Mexico uh, on July 13th through 15th. And then the Youth Curriculum Exchange on the 21st. Red Hot Preaching Conference in Sacramento from July 27th through 29th. Uh, the Donuts again in August. And the Spanish Night is going to be again on August 10th because we're not doing the Spanish Night in July because we're just going all the way to Mexico in July for that trip. And um, that trip is not for everyone because of the fact that we're only taking people who actually speak Spanish well enough to win souls in Spanish and you have to have already won a bunch of people who are in Spanish to be able to go on that trip. Okay. So if you if you want to be certified on your level of Spanish, come see me and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you or we'll try to make sure that you actually know how to speak Spanish. Now of course, don't get me wrong, anybody who wants to pay their own way and, and buy their own tickets and buy their own uh, Flights or, or, or whatever, food, hotel. Obviously, anybody can buy it. I'm just saying, to come in the church group, we're only going to sponsor those who uh, actually know how to speak Spanish. This isn't just an all expense paid Mexico vacation. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
In the Lord put on my trust, how say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain, for lo, the wicked men there fall. Make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. John chapter 5, toward the very end of the New Testament, 1 John chapter 5, as we always do, we'll read the entire chapter, beginning in verse number 1, 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse number 1, follow along silently with Brother Josh Hall as he reads 1 John chapter 5, starting in verse number 1. First John chapter 5, the Bible reads, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For, our, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we have asked anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. 
If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God has come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Brother Long, would you pray for us? Man, the title of my sermon this morning is The Trinity in Scripture. The Trinity in Scripture. We're going to start here in 1 John chapter 5. But first of all, let me say this, and I want you to pay very careful attention to this. The sermon that I preached on Wednesday night, everybody in this church needs to listen to that sermon. Okay, so if you weren't there on Wednesday night, you need to download that from the church website, or you need to go on YouTube and find that. You need to hear that sermon in addition to the sermon that I'm preaching this morning. I'm not going to re-preach Wednesday's sermon. I'm going to preach something different. And so you need to listen to it. And if you don't have access to the internet or you don't have a way to download that and listen to that, then come see me and I will get you a CD of that because I want every single person in our church to listen to that sermon on the Pentecostal oneness doctrine debunked that I preached on Wednesday night. This is a heresy that crept into our church. Thankfully, it was only a few people affected, but these Judases, Tyler Baker, Elliot Ray, Rick Martinez, and now Russell Bops, those four have been going around teaching this garbage, spreading this around secretly, being careful who they told it to, approaching people that were new to our church, or people that were young, or people that were in their very tight-knit circle of friends. Okay, this heresy that they've been teaching of modalism or Pentecostal oneness doctrine will not be tolerated. This is not an optional doctrine. This is not a little difference of opinion. This is not another take that they have on the Trinity. This is an out and out rejection of the Trinity and a teaching of hardcore oneness or modalist doctrine. Funny, they can't show you the difference between what they teach and modalism or oneness doctrine, because it is textbook modalism. To, this morning I'm going to preach the truth to you, get Wednesday's sermon, but I have another mountain of evidence here, and frankly I'm probably going to preach on this tonight also just because there's so much material I can't even get through it all. So I better jump right in. 1 John chapter 5 verse number 7 is probably the most famous verse on the Trinity, and we're going to start reading in verse 6. The Bible says, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's the famous verse, these three are one. Then it says in verse 8, and, these, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. Now, let's just get our bearings here, first of all. What does the Trinity teach, and what does this modalist oneness heresy teach? Well, the Trinity teaches that there's one God who is composed of or made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one but they are three that are distinct one from another. Modalism or oneness doctrine teaches that there's one God and he is just one spirit, one entity who just reveals himself in different modes. So he'll reveal himself as the Father, as the Son, as the Holy Ghost. Those are just three different modes and it's sort of like I'm a husband, a pastor and a father, but I'm the same person, but I'm just acting in three different capacities. 
or uh, the, the illustration that these heretics were using was, it's like a one-man band. It's just God picking up a different instrument and using a different instrument. You know, he's the guitarist, then he's the drummer, then he's the whatever. But that's a lie. That's a false doctrine. The Bible is very clear that the Father is not the Son. The Father is not the Holy Ghost. The Son is not the Holy Ghost. That The Father is the Father, the Son is the Son, and the Holy Ghost is the Holy Ghost. Now, these three are one, and they together, collectively, comprise one God, made up of Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's what the Trinity teaches. I'm going to prove that to you from the Bible. Now, let's start out in the famous verse, because I think a lot of people miss the context of what this verse is even saying. At the beginning of the verse, it says, there are three that bear record in heaven. Don't miss that. What does it mean to bear record? Well, right here in this passage, we see that that term is used synonymously with testifying or bearing witness. Imagine going to court and someone testifies. Someone bears record. Someone bears witness. What God is saying here is that we have multiple witnesses to the truth of the gospel. And the Bible says here that there are three that bear record. At the end of verse 6, it says, it's the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. Then it says there are three that bear record. Verse 8, there are three that bear witness in earth. Verse 9 is key as well. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. So what does it mean when it says we receive the witness of men? It means that when two or three people testify of something, we receive that accusation. Because the Bible said that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. One witness can't rise up against someone to cause them to be put to death. There has to be two or three witnesses. Okay, so God's saying, look, we, we will accept the witness of two or three men, but how much more would we accept the witness of God when there are three witnesses? Right. Now, what if I went into the courtroom and said, you know, okay, I am Pastor Stephen Harrison, and then I testify. And then the judge says, are there any more witnesses? Yes, I'm going to call my second witness, Stephen Anderson, the father. <laughs> All right, let me call my third witness, Stephen Anderson, the husband. That's not three witnesses. Me in three different modes is not three witnesses. Now go to John chapter 8. This is the only thing I'm going to show you from the book of John, because my whole Wednesday night sermon was only in the book of John, and this morning's sermon is going to be everywhere else. But first, I just need to expound this important truth from 1 John 5, that there are three that bear record in heaven, the three witnesses. And the Bible says in John chapter 8, verse 13, the Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but you cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. Why? For I'm not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. It's also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I'm one that beareth witness of myself. And the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. That's two totally distinct witnesses. That's the context of 1 John 5, 7. So why don't you get that context and bring that into 1 John 5, 7, where it says there are three that bear record in heaven. If it was all the same person in three different modes, that's not three witnesses. And so there are two heresies that we need to avoid. Number one, we need to avoid the heresy of saying that the three are not one. That's where you get into people who deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Your Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. Only cults would do that. Every born-again child of God acknowledges that deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is fully God. Jesus is God. There's no question about that. But the other heresy is to go in the other direction and deny that there are three witnesses, that there are three that bear record in heaven, and that God is composed of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and say, no, 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 it's just one spirit, one person, one entity, just revealing himself in different ways. Go, if you would, to Genesis chapter 1. And again, some of the best scripture to debunk this stuff is in John, which is the most basic book that we give to every new believer, and in Genesis, which is 
a, a starting point. I mean, most people, when they start reading the Bible, if they don't start in John, they probably start in Genesis. They probably just open it to page one. So this is a doctrine that's laid out from the beginning in Scripture. And so my first point this morning is to go through all of the Scriptures in the Old Testament that teach this plurality of three. Not just one, but three that are one. Okay, that's something that you can carry all throughout Scripture. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, And God said, Let us, notice, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And this can't be God talking to the angels or anything because the angels are not in God's image. He says, let us make man in our image. And plus, that's debunked in the next verse because it says, so God created man in his own image. Notice the singular. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So right here it's let us make man in our image after our likeness and then it's so God made it in his image. One God that is made up of three, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And so that's why that conversation can even make sense. Let us make man in our image. It's very clear. Go if you would to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. The Bible says in Genesis 3, verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Go to chapter 11. That's another instance so we've seen it in chapter 1, we've seen it in chapter 3. Let's go to chapter 11 of Genesis. Chapter 11, verse 5, the Bible reads, The Lord God, I'm sorry, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they've imagined to do. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Go to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter number 6. So we're going through some Old Testament scriptures right now to show that this doctrine is not unique to the New Testament. And even if it were something that was not revealed until the New Testament, it's revealed hundreds of times in the New Testament. I mean, I showed scores of times on, on Wednesday night from the book of John alone. But this is something that you can actually see even in the Old Testament. And Jews have a real hard time with those plurals in Genesis 1, Genesis 3, and Genesis 11. The ones who reject Jesus Christ, I mean, they choke on that. They have no answer for that because it's so clear that God is saying, let us, our image, our likeness, and so forth. Look at Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. The Bible says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? <laughs> you see that? who will go for us, then said I, here am I, send me. Go to Isaiah chapter number 48, verse 15. Isaiah 48, verse 15. Verse 16 in Isaiah 48 is a pretty powerful Old Testament verse on the Trinity. And so don't miss this. Isaiah 48, we're going to start reading in verse 15. The Bible reads, I, even I, have spoken, yea, I have called him, I have brought him, and he shall make his way prosperous. Come ye near unto me, hear ye this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there am I, and now the Lord God and his Spirit hath sent me. Now that's an Old Testament verse that contains all three members of the Godhead right there in one verse. Because Jesus is saying, that from the time that it was, from the beginning, I am. He said, from the beginning, there am I. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. So the son is sent by the Lord God and his spirit. Now, if you look at this, it's very similar to what Jesus said when he said, before Abraham was, I am. He said, hey, even before it was, there was I. And there's the Lord God and his spirit hath sent me. 
Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. Now go back if you would to, we're going to get back into this, but while we're in Isaiah, let's deal with one of their proof texts from Isaiah. Let's go back to Isaiah 9, 6. Because this is basically the verse that their whole doctrine hangs on. If you listen to all the rest of their arguments, they are bizarre, they're convoluted, they're turning scripture on its head. Really, this is their only verse where you can even look at it and say, okay, I see what you're saying. There's one verse like that. But what you have to understand is that you can never just base your whole doctrine on one verse and turn the rest of the Bible on its head. That's exactly what the work salvationists do with James 2. And these people keep saying, well, if I can just show you one verse, then, 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 you know, then case closed. No, wrong. Because you know what? I could show you one verse on getting baptized for the dead. The Mormons have a verse that they point to. I could show you one verse on work salvation. But guess what? They'd both be out of context. I could show you all kinds of things using one verse because heresy is always based on one verse that's twisted and taken out of context. No, no, no. When you have a hundred verses saying one thing or a thousand verses saying one thing and then you have one verse, you can't just say, well, here it is, case closed. But look, Isaiah 9, 6 is their one verse because the rest of their arguments are dumb. Okay, this is the only one that you can even stop and go, hmm, or scratch your head about. But I'm going to show you, it does not mean what they're saying it means. And by the way, this is the same exact mistake that Sam Gipp is making with Isaiah 7, 14. It's the identical mistake. Let's look at it. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says this, For unto us a child is born. Obviously, this is Jesus. It's a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Unto us a child is born. And unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So this is their one verse to say that Jesus is God the Father. Because right there it says his name shall be called the Everlasting Father. Now, first of all, let me stop and say this. That these modalists, where the whole doctrine even came from in modern times, is from the baptism issue of baptizing in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Ghost, versus in the name of Jesus only. That's where this whole modalist doctrine even comes from in the 20th century. There's an ancient heresy of modalism, but it was dead for a long time, and it was picked up again by the Pentecostals in the early 20th century around 1914. But here's what's funny, is that these modalist heretics in our church, or these modalist oneness Pentecostals, here's what they say. Yeah, but what's the name of the Father? What's the name of the Son? What's the name of the Holy Ghost? They're saying that the Father is not a name. That's why they're saying there's no name revealed in the New Testament except the name of Jesus. So they're not acknowledging that the Father is a name. They're saying that's not a name, it's a title. This is what modalists teach. Father's a title, Son's a title, Holy Ghost title. But what's the name? Jesus, because that's what they claim. But then all of a sudden in Isaiah 9, 6, now all of a sudden Father's a name again. You know, so which one is it? You see what I mean? Their, their two biggest proof texts are Matthew 28 and Isaiah 9, 6. These are their two biggest proof texts and they're at odds with one another. Because in one of them, the whole point is, well, the Father can't be a name. That's just a title. The name of the Father actually means Jesus because that's his name. And then over in Isaiah 9, 6, it's like, well, no, no, boy, it says his name is, is the Father. <laughs> well, is, is Father a name or not? Okay, but beside that confusion and, and ridiculousness, let me just show you what this means. Go back to Isaiah 7, 14. Keep your finger in Isaiah 9. In Isaiah 7, 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. In the New Testament, the Bible defines this for us since we don't speak Hebrew. It says Emmanuel, what's being interpreted is God with us. Now, is that the name that Jesus was actually given when he was born? No, the name that he was given is Jesus. So why does it say that his name shall be called Emmanuel? Why? Because that is his attribute, God with us. He was God with us. So that's why his name's called Emmanuel. 
That's where Sam Gipp gets it wrong. These guys are making the same mistake. Go to Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Now, is Jesus' name really supposed to be Wonderful? Hello, my name is Wonderful? Think about that. Is that actually what this is saying when it says his name shall be called Wonderful? Is it saying that he actually is named Wonderful? No, it's not. Nor is it saying that his name is actually named Counselor. You see, wonderful is an attribute of Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us, is an attribute of Jesus. Counselor is an attribute of Jesus. And you say, well, where do you get that in the Bible? Because the word name in the Bible sometimes is referring to a literal name, but sometimes it means who they are, a reputation. You say, prove it. Okay, how about this? A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. And loving favor rather than silver and gold. What does the Bible mean when it says a good name is rather to be chosen than riches? It's not saying, man, Stephen is such a cool name. I'm so glad my parents gave me that name. Is that what it means? Or man, faithful word is such a cool name for a church. No, a good name is rather to be chosen than silver. It means a good reputation. It's who you are. It's what your attributes are, your name. How about this one? He wanted to make a name for himself. Is it saying he's sitting down and designing a new logo with a new name for himself? No. If he's making a name for himself, it's what his reputation is. It's what he's like, okay? For example, how about this verse? A good name is better than precious ointment. Ecclesiastes 7.1. And the day of death and the day of one's birth. Song of Solomon chapter 1 verse 3. Because of the savor of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. That's not saying that a literal name is being poured out like ointment. Okay, this is talking about who they are, what they're known as, their reputation. Or what about this one? Genesis 11 where it says, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name. They want to be renowned. They want to be well known. They want that reputation. Deuteronomy 25, 10. And his name shall be called in Israel the house of him that hath his shoe loosed. Now, do you really think that it's saying that you walk up to somebody and say, hello, house of him that hath his shoe loosed. How you doing, buddy? That's a mouthful. What it's saying is that his name shall be called in Israel. His name shall be called, same wording, the house of him that hath his shoe loose. What? That's what he's going to be known for. Oh, he's that guy who didn't raise up seed unto his brother. He's that guy who had his shoe loose. He's going to be known that way. How about this? Your name's mud. His name's mud. That doesn't literally mean that their name is mud, but to call somebody's name mud or to say in the name of, you know, or whatever, these are other uses of the word name. It's that simple. And also, uh, you know, Isaiah 56, 5, there's lots of illustrations that, you know, uh, even unto them will I give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and daughters and so forth. So when the Bible says his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, none of those is a literal name because his literal name was Jesus. Emmanuel and all this other list are the attributes. He has the attribute of being wonderful. He has the attributes of the Mighty God. Why? Because he is God and because in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, he is not equivalent to the fullness of the Godhead, but he has the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in him. I have the Holy Spirit in me. It doesn't make me the Holy Spirit, though, the fact that I have the Holy Spirit in me. Not only that, but he is, the Bible says, the image of the invisible God. Get that. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That's why he could say, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I'm in the Father, the Father in me. I mean, it's sort of like if I said, well, you know, if you've seen John McPhail, you've seen Jesse McPhail. <laughs> you say, I want to know what he looks like. They're identical twins. <laughs> okay, so the point is that when the Bible says here, 
His name shall be called, it lists the attributes. He has the attributes of God. He has the attributes of the Father. He represents the Father. He came in his Father's name. He's the image of the invisible God. That's what it means. Now, another example of this that I thought was a pretty good illustration is that of an ambassador. Jesus represented God the Father because it said, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. He hath declared him. Okay. Think about an ambassador from another country. They represent that country. They've come in that country's name. They have the attributes of that country. And if they were in the United Nations and we said, Saudi Arabia got up and walked out of the meeting. People say that. Or America got up and left the meeting. You know, China wouldn't even sit through the meeting. <laughs> Iran walked out when they said that. Why? Because that is the ambassador, the representative. So if you're just going to take this one verse and turn the whole rest of the Bible on its head, then you just hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more. Because we believe in the Trinity here. The Bible's crystal clear in hundreds of verses, and this is not going to turn the whole rest of the Bible on its head any more so than just demanding that his name is literally comforter or, or wonderful, or I'm sorry, counselor, Emmanuel, or what have you. Go to Hosea chapter 12. Hosea chapter number 12. And also they have a problem anyway because they're, they're pitting Matthew 28 and Isaiah 9, 6 against each other. They're two, they're two biggest proof texts are at odds with one another. Doesn't even make sense. Jesus Christ has the attributes of being everlasting and being a father unto us. He also represents the everlasting father. He's the image of the everlasting father. But to just come out and say, well, no, Jesus is the father and the father is Jesus. The son is the father. The father is the son. That is heresy. That is false. It's a lie. Look at uh, Isaiah, I'm sorry, where did I have you turn, Hosea? Isaiah. Here's another us, because I wanted to show you the us, our, like I did in Genesis 1, Genesis 3. Here's another instance of that in Hosea chapter 12, verse 3, it says, He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. Even the Lord God of hosts, the Lord is his memorial. So Jacob is said to have spoken with us. God says Jacob spoke with us there. Okay. Now go back, if you would, in your Bible to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. This is a pretty famous verse. And it's another one that, that people who deny the deity of Christ struggle with, people who deny the Trinity struggle with, Jews would struggle with this. This is a pretty powerful verse. And that's why this verse, Psalm 110, verse 1, is used throughout the New Testament to prove the deity of Christ. The apostles are constantly bringing up the scripture to, to, to prove that Jesus is God. But it's pretty clear from this verse that it's not oneness, it's not modalism, it's a trinity. Because look at Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, how is that one person talking? The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand. Hello, is anybody home? Sit thou at my right hand. There's not one throne with one guy sitting in it and yada, yada, yada. No, no, no. The Lord said unto my Lord, that's the Father talking to the Son, sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And there's no mystery about what that means because that verse is quoted throughout the New Testament. That's how the apostles are constantly interpreting it from this uh, scripture. Look at verse 2. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Go, if you would, to Psalm 45. While you're turning to Psalm 45, I'll give you some New Testament quotes on what we just read. In Matthew 22, it says, What think ye of Christ? 
whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. He saith unto them, how then did David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And David himself saith in the book of Psalms, it says in Luke 20, verse 42, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore calleth him Lord. How is he then his son? You know, so he's explaining that it's not that the Messiah is just a physical descendant of David, but that he's actually the Lord and that he predates David because the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Acts 2.34 says the exact same thing uh, pretty much. Look at Psalm 45. How about this? Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Now let's stop right there and ask ourselves, who is being addressed here? If we just only had this one verse, it's just we just have this one verse, we read this verse, we're reading Psalms, who's being addressed in this verse? God. Everybody see that? Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So, O God, he's saying, I'm talking to you. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Everybody got that? Now look at the next verse. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest iniquity, therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now, look at what this verse is saying. He's addressing someone as God. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. He says to that same person that God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above your fellows. How can that be? How can God talk, how, how can basically it be said unto God that his God has anointed him? Does everybody see what we're saying? Okay, this is interpreted in Hebrews 1. Let's go to Hebrews 1 and get the interpretation. Because this is a scripture that on its face is difficult to understand, especially if you were living back in the days of the Old Testament. And you see, thy throne, O God, and then it says, therefore God has anointed you, O God. How can God anoint God? How, think about it. Is everybody following? How can God anoint God? Here's how God can anoint God. The Father anoints the Son. The Father's God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit are God because they all collectively make up the Godhead. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty clear. Look, let's see, let's see how it's interpreted in Hebrews. It says in verse number eight, but unto the Son he saith. So that proves right there that the one that's being addressed is the Son that's being addressed. Unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hate iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, who are we talking about? The Father, because the Father is often just referred to as God in the Bible. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So in verses 8 and 9, two things are explicitly proven. Number one, it's proven that Jesus is God. Because under the sun he saith, thy throne, O God. But it's also explicitly proven that there's someone else who is saying that to him, who is also God, who is his God. And since we know there's only one God, it makes perfect sense when you understand that Jesus was in the beginning with God and he was God because there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And that's how God can say, let's make man in our image after our likeness. I'm trying to make this simple. I'm trying to make this easy to understand. I'm trying to make it as clear as I can. And I can, look, I can understand a, a, a new believer getting turned around on this. I can understand uh, somebody who hasn't read a lot of Bible getting a little mixed up on this. I can understand, especially when they're, when they're hearing false teaching, they could get spun around on this or confused on this. But you know what? If anybody has this explained to them and scripture is shown unto them, and they just still deny the Trinity? He that is of God heareth God's words. Right. Ye therefore hear them not because you're not of God. Right. This is not some Bible prophecy interpretation. This is not some gray area. This isn't something that is, it, you know, there's only a few verses and we have to try to figure it out. This is something where there's just a mountain of scripture. 
And something's wrong when you can see all this scripture on the train. And if you could sit through that sermon on Wednesday night with just 50 proofs from the book of John alone, you know, something's wrong. Because this doctrine is laid out pretty clearly in the Bible. And I can even understand somebody maybe, you know, uh, misspeaking or, or explaining something using a bad illustration. I mean, we, you know, everybody's done that where they maybe use a bad illustration and then think back that, you know, oh, that wasn't the best illustration. And obviously any illustration we use to talk about the Trinity is going to fall short. Right. Because God is God and, and, you know, we can relate him to things like, you know, we could say, for example, it's like an egg, you know, the, the shell and the yolk and the, and the white, but it's one egg composes one egg or, or whatever, or the body, soul, and spirit composes who we are. Every illustration is going to, at some point, break down. It's going to, at some point, not measure up. Those are just things to help us grasp the truth. But when you can just sit there and just go into full-blown oneness Pentecostalism, full-blown modalism, and don't, look, do not for one second believe the lie that they're not teaching oneness or that they're somehow like halfway between modalism and trinity. It is a lie. There is zilch, zero, nada different between what they're teaching and the oneness or modalism doctrine. It's just, it's just that clear. And they'll try to say, oh, well, we're not saying that there's no distinction. Between, you know, because we, because I'm saying there's, they're not putting a difference between the Father and the Son. But they're saying, no, 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 there's a distinction. That, but listen to what they say when they explain the distinction. Here's what they say. Oh, there's a difference between Jesus Christ as a human and Jesus Christ as God. They put a difference between the humanity of Christ and the deity of Christ, but they put no distinction between the Son and the Father and the Holy Ghost. But they do a bait and switch. We're talking about distinguishing the Father from the Son from the Holy Ghost. They do a little bait and switch where they, oh, there's a distinction between the deity of Christ and his humanity. <laughs> Don't you fall for their sleight of hand. Right. Okay. Go if you would, or let's just, let's just continue here in Hebrews 1. Hebrews chapter 1, and let's read the whole chapter because there, there are multiple things that they pull out of this chapter and twist and confuse. Uh, it's bizarre. But look at chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Now, even just at first blush, this is, again, not one person. I mean, you can read any chapter in the New Testament practically and see fathers loving the son, the father sent the son, the son returns to the father, the father anoints the son, the father, you know, it's like, come on. But it says, you know, he's, he's also uh, spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So the father made the world by Jesus Christ. That's why it says that Jesus made the whole world. Jesus is the creator because the father made the world by the son. The Bible says, who being the brightness of his glory. So Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. Or the, and in the, in the context here, he's the brightness of the Father's glory, right? Everybody following along? Perk up, pay attention, or you're going to be sucked in by these people. You'll be next. <laughs> who being the brightness of his glory in the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Right. Now, stop and look at this. It uses the word person. Now, the Bible says that Jesus is the express image of his person. Does it say Jesus is that same person? No. His person. Okay, it doesn't say that he's the express image of himself. That wouldn't make any sense anyway. If I say, Dustin, you are just the spitting image of yourself. You look just like yourself. But what if I looked at his son or his daughter and said, wow, they are your spitting image. Or what if I said to a twin that his twin looks just like him? That makes sense. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That's what the Bible says. Jesus, no man has seen the Father. Nobody can see his face and live. 
Jesus is that image of the Father. And so when the Bible says that Jesus is the express image of his person, of his person, it's not saying that they are one and the same person, that they are equivalent to each other, that they're, you know, the Father's the Son, the Son's the Father, wrong. He sat down the right hand of the uh, majesty on high. Being made so much more, so much better than the angels as he by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I'll be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Is everybody getting all this? And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning, hast laid the foundation of the earth. This is also being said to the Son. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? While we're in Hebrews, go to chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter number 9, verse 14. The Bible reads, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offer himself without spot to God? Look, that's the Trinity, friend. Jesus Christ, through the eternal Spirit, offered himself to himself? Is that what it says? That he offered himself to himself. No, he offered himself without spot to God, referring to the Father. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Point number two, and, and no, they're not all going to be as long as point one. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 11. So point number one, we studied the Old Testament and saw evidence in the Old Testament. First on Wednesday, we just demolished modalism, demolished oneness with just the book of John alone. I mean, destroyed it. It was embarrassing. It was laughable. It was just, it was just a total, utter, just complete, just demolition, just game over. Just put a fork in it. It's done. But not only that, we just looked at a lot of Old Testament evidence because we looked at the stuff from Genesis, Psalms, Isaiah, Hosea. And then we also took it into the New Testament, Hebrews 1, because Hebrews 1 is doing what? It's referring back to that stuff. Hebrews 1 was a reference back to Psalm 110 and, and back to uh, Psalm number 45. So we saw the Old Testament witness. That's what I focused on this morning. But let's also... Look at number two, that there is a chain of command in the Godhead. If the Father is Jesus and Jesus is the Father and it's just God in different modes, God's just one, one spirit in different modes or in different manifestations, then how is there a chain of command in the Godhead? Now let me just come right out and tell you that Tyler Baker, Elliot Ray, Rick Martinez and Russell Bops are saying there is no chain of command. They're just, they flat out say there is no chain of command. Not only that, they say that uh, there's no difference in the will of the Father from the will of the Son. They're explicitly saying that. Even though there's clear scripture that says, not my will, but thine be done. I've come not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Not as I will, but as thou wilt. They're denying that there's any chain of command whatsoever. Just like, and look, it's not that I have failed to teach people. I have taught on the Trinity frequently. And not only that, I just talked about it a couple months ago. I knew I had just talked about it and I couldn't figure out when I talked about it. 
And uh, we were in Albuquerque, and Brother Berg reminded me. He said, hey, it was that, that sermon on the shack. Remember that book, The Shack? Guess what the shack teaches? Modalism. Oneness, Pentecostalism. Why? Because in the shack, it says there's no chain of command between Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. They all submit to each other. There's no chain of command. And not only that, but in the book, The Shack, God the Father has holes in the hands. And the Holy Spirit has holes in the hands that God the Father died on the cross for us. Okay. And this is known as, and this goes hand in hand with, and I know this is a weird, fancy theological term, patropassionalism <laughs> is the doctrine that God the Father died on the cross for us. That's a false doctrine. That's right. It's a lie. And that's, you know, it's, it's part of this oneness modalist package. And, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. This ties in with Hinduism as well. You're like, don't get on the Hindus again. <laughs> but look, I told you, remember the, the author of the shack was into Hinduism. He named the Holy Spirit after a Hindu god in that book. He taught all kinds of Hinduism. Well, in Hinduism, it's the same thing, where there's only one god in different manifestations. That's what Hindu, Hinduism teaches, one spirit that's in different modes, and that Krishna is an avatar of their one true God. And that basically is what this modalist, it turns Jesus into an avatar of God, or an avatar of the Father, when in reality, these are distinct and uh, the, these are not the same person. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And you know, this is what it's been traditionally explained as, God in three persons, like the song, you know, holy, 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 and it says, God in three persons, blessed trinity. You know, we just sang that at, uh, at Verity a while back. It's not in our hymnal, but it was a chorus of the week in, um, in Verity Baptist. But that's how it's been explained because it's not one and the same person of just the Son is the Father, the Father is the Holy Ghost. It's just not biblical. But the shack teaches that. Okay, and, and you say, well, why bring up the shack? The only reason I'm bringing up the shack is simply to illustrate the fact that I just taught this two months ago. Yep. And I've taught this repeatedly. I, I've done other sermons. Look, the Revelation DVD series. In episode 22, I went into a big 20-minute spiel, and then I uploaded it as its own video a year ago just to refresh it in people's minds. I've done sermons on this. I've taught on this. In fact, sometimes I felt like I was running 1 Corinthians 15 into the ground I was bringing it up so much. And I didn't even know why I was bringing it up so much, but now I understand that God was leading me to bring it up because what if I hadn't have taught it? What if I hadn't have brought it up? It could have caused people to get even more confused and even more people to be deceived if I hadn't have brought that up. So I'm thankful that God allowed me to preach on this multiple times with, and without even really fully understanding why I was spending so much time on that. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. The Bible says, But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. The head of Christ is God. Now, what does that mean? Well, when the Bible says that the, that the man is the head of the woman, Obviously, that's talking about authority. If we talked about the head of a company, the head of a corporation, the head of the church, who's the head of the church? Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. So the head is the boss. So the woman, who's her, who's her boss? Who's her head? Her husband. Okay, well, who's the boss of Christ? God. That's what it says. The head of Christ is God. Okay, go to chapter, 20, or chapter 15, verse 22. Because some people would say, well, you know, that's just while Jesus was on this earth, you know, because that's what they want to make the big distinction between the humanity and deity of Christ. Hey, he put all that aside to become human. But hold on. 1 Corinthians 11 is not being written while Jesus is walking on this earth. Jesus has already died, been buried, risen again, and been glorified and seated at the right hand of the Father. And yet Paul says, present tense, the head of Christ is God. God is the head of Christ, meaning that there is authority structure between the Father and the Son. But even if we go beyond the present day 
and we go way into the future, beyond the millennial reign of Christ, we see that there's still a chain of command between the Father and the Son. And let me say this, if Jesus is the Father and the Father is Jesus, then what would be the point of even having a millennial reign of Christ? I mean, think about that. Because the Bible says that Jesus will reign forever and ever. The Bible says we will reign forever and ever. So what's, what's the millennium then? Why have, a, why have a thousand year reign and then let's reign some more? <laughs> he's going to reign for a thousand years and then he's going to reign some more. Here's why it makes sense. Because of the fact that during the thousand year reign, Jesus Christ, the Son, will directly reign on this earth. He will be present on this earth, physically, bodily on this earth. The Son of God will be on this earth ruling and reigning for 1,000 years. But then that ends, friend. It doesn't go on forever because what happens at the end of the 1,000 years, he delivers up the kingdom to the Father. And guess what? Then the Father actually, literally comes and reigns on this earth and is present with us. And we will see his face Amen. at that point. At this time, no one can see his face and live. Listen to me, when you go to heaven, you're not going to just look right into the face of God the Father when you get there. You will see the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why when, even when Stephen looked up and he saw the glory of God, the glory of God and Jesus at his right, standing at his right hand of the Father. Right? And let me read that for you while I'm on the subject. It says in um, Acts chapter number uh, 7, you don't have to turn there, but in Acts 7, keep, keep your finger where we are in Corinthians, but in Acts 7, 55, it says, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, this is Stephen, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. So is he looking up and seeing one person? No, he sees the glory of God. Why? Because he can't just explicitly see the face of God the Father. He sees the glory of God and he sees the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Okay, so when we get to heaven, we're going to be face to face with Jesus, the Son of God, right? Then we're going to return with him on white horses to rule and reign with Christ a thousand years on this earth. That's the Son of God right there, okay? That's different than after the great white throne when God the Father will personally directly reign. Not the Son directly reigning and the Father up in heaven. No, no, no. He will dwell among them. And we shall see his face and his name shall be in our foreheads. That's different. That's, the, that's why it makes sense to have a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Then there's just God's reign. Now, does Jesus continue reigning? Sure. As the second in command. As the second in command. Just as we're going to continue reigning. We shall reign forever and ever, but not as the top boss of our own planet like the Mormons would teach, right? You know, it's God the Father. And, and look, let's just, there's no mystery about it. Here's the chain of command. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's not complicated. That's the chain of command. Look, if you would, at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, and I'll prove what I just told you about the millennium. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So we're talking about the resurrection. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. So Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He's the only one, by the way, who rose from the dead to never die again. Other people who were brought back to life in the Bible, they all died again. Like Lazarus is not still alive. <laughs> Lazarus came out of the tomb, but then he died eventually. Now, they probably waited a long time to bury him just to make sure, <laughs> but he died. Okay, other dead bodies in the Old Testament where people like, you know, where Elisha raised a dead body back to life or Jesus raised a few dead bodies back to life or, or when, you know, the, 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 when, cruci when Jesus was crucified on the cross and rose again, the, it talks about how uh, there were some bodies of the saints that came out of the graves and walked into the city and everything. Those people all died again. Okay, just like, uh, you know, Lazarus and everybody. The only person who truly resurrected from the dead to die again no more is Jesus. He was the first fruits of the resurrection. 
Because it says, as an Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. This is the rapture, the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ rise first, we which are alive and remain to be caught up together with them in the clouds. So here's the resurrection of the dead timeline. Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. That's known as the first resurrection. There's the first fruits, then there's the first resurrection. But there's another resurrection, a second resurrection. Because the Bible says the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. So there's another dead coming to live again after the millennium. And that's talking about the saved, only the saved, because the unsaved are never going to live again. That's why it says, I saw the dead small and great stand before God. And they're, you know, they're cast into the lake of fire if they're not saved and so forth. And the ones who are uh, saved, they live again. That's why there's a resurrection unto life and a resurrection unto damnation. Resurrect simply means to rise up again. It doesn't mean that you're alive. Because he said, I saw the dead small and great stand before God. The books are open. The dead are judged. Okay. So there's basically Jesus is the first fruits. Then there's the first resurrection at the rapture. And then there's a second resurrection after the millennium. Look what it says. Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Verse 24. Then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. Now, what do people not understand about this verse? Christ reigns and then he delivers up the kingdom to God. And even if someone were to just read 27 and 28 and dispute it, if they just back up to 24, it tells them that God here is referring to the Father. He delivers up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority. And look, by the way, stop right there. If, if, if Jesus were not God, why would you have to specify even the Father? Right? Because, look, the people who are reading this already believe in the deity of Christ. I believe in the deity of Christ. You believe in the deity of Christ. I believe Jesus is God. Every Baptist believes Jesus is God. Every non-denom Christian believes that Jesus is God, okay? We all believe Jesus is God. That's why when he says he's going to deliver up the kingdom to God, he makes it real clear. You know, we're talking about the Father. Why? Because there's someone else we could be talking about when we say God. We could be referring to Jesus or we could be referring to the Holy Ghost. So he says, then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till, till, that means until he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. See, after the millennium, after the great white throne, there's a new heaven, new earth. There's no more sorrow, no crying, no death. No more death. Death is destroyed. He's going to destroy all enemies. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet, meaning that the Father put all things under the Son's feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it's manifest. What's manifest mean? It's obvious. Yeah. It's exposed. It's obvious. Look, obviously when it says the Father put all things under his feet, it's obvious. It's manifest. Yeah that the exception is he himself, that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. What's it saying? The father did not put himself under the son. He put everything else under the son. Everything except him. That's why it says except at the end. It doesn't say accepted like A-C-C. -C. It's E-X-C. Accepted. It's an exception. Everything's under Jesus except the father. Okay, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son. So once everything has been, see right now, we see not yet all things put under him. The Bible says, we see not yet all things put under him in Hebrews. All things are not under Jesus' feet right now. But after the millennium and the great white throne, everything will be placed under Jesus, everything. So at that point, when everything's placed under Jesus, when all things shall be subdued under him, unto him, then shall the Son also be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So the chain of command is still intact at the very end, when 
everything's over. The Bible calls it the end. Then cometh the end. When everything's subdued, every enemy has been destroyed, the last enemy that's destroyed is death, and then at that point, Jesus will be himself subject unto the Father. He will submit unto the Father. Look, he submitted unto the Father on this earth. Repeatedly saying that in John to the point of just it, bizarreness that anybody would not see that he said that so many times. He, constantly, he says in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's not my will, but thine be done. Not as I will as that. It's in all four Gospels. These statements about submitting to the Father. We know that during the time of the New Testament, during the time of churches and, and uh, where we live right now and the book of Acts and, and 2017, 1 Corinthians 11 tells us that the head of Christ is God. And then even if we go all the way into the future, to the very end, he's still submitting to the Father. So how can these people say that there's no chain of command? How can they say, oh, they have the identical will? Folks, it's a lie. It's a fraud. This is something that, and that, you know, I'm going to have to, to stop with the sermon at that point simply because, you know, we're out of time. And, and I'm going to preach on this again tonight. And look, this was not a repeat of Wednesday night sermon. So don't think to yourself, well, hey, I already heard this. No, no, no. You need to go home and listen to that Wednesday night sermon. Yeah. You need Wednesday night sermon and this morning sermon and tonight's sermon. Amen. These three are one, friend. Yeah. Right? <laughs> three witnesses here. Look. Wait a minute. He's saying the Wednesday night sermon is the Sunday morning sermon. <laughs> well, if they, they, I guess you only need to listen to one then. Three different modes of the same sermon. No, 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 these are three totally different sermons, but they're all preaching the same truth. Right. Okay, so the point is that uh, you need to hear the Wednesday night sermon. You know, I believe that this morning's sermon was pretty clear. If not, maybe you need to go listen to it again. But honestly, you should come back tonight and hear even more because there's just so much on this subject. And these guys have been nefarious, they've been devilish, they've been diabolical. And I didn't realize, when I fired Tyler Baker, I didn't realize how bad it was because I just found out about it. I had no clue about this last Sunday. No clue. Did not see this coming at all. And I found out about this on Monday morning and it wasn't until I came out and said, hey, we fired him, he's teaching heresy, He's going around teaching. And I had a list of all the people that he admitted teaching it to. But then we went to the preaching class on Tuesday night. Who was at the preaching class on Tuesday night? Put up your hands. A lot of hands, right? About th there were about 30 guys total that were there. I did a quick little head count. There were about 30 guys on Tuesday at the preaching class. And there were a whole bunch of people standing up. Oh, yeah. He talked to me about it. Oh, yeah. He told me about it. And then I, I like how Elliot, how Elliot says... Oh, yeah, I was telling one of these guys about it, and he told me to stop the car and let him out of the car. He didn't even want to take the ride from me. But then they act like I'm crazy for thinking that this is a big deal, attacking the Trinity. Because these people are saying that the, the, the doctrine that all Baptists teach on the Trinity is all wrong. We need to get on this new doctrine. Divers and strange doctrines. But people got up on Tuesday night and they testified. And they said, oh yeah, he talked to me about it at this event. He talked about it on this occasion. And look, Elliot came out and said, you know, it's being made out that Tyler Baker was the mastermind of this, but that's not really how it happened. Because, you know, he figured out, Elliot figured it out on his own. So we're supposed to believe that all these guys just independently figured this out on their own. At the same time, in the same church, everybody else in the whole you know, independent fundamental Baptist world and even Southern Baptist world all believes in the Trinity, but these guys just all coincidentally all just started finding this stuff. <laughs> but it's because they all are lifted up with pride and it's like they all don't want to be playing second fiddle. So it's like, well, you know, he didn't really come up with it. I came up with it on my own. And by the way, we had people testify because Tyler Baker's like, oh, I came up with this on my own from the Bible. But then in the next breath, it's like, oh, well, I just had a question about this one verse, and then Rick and Elliot pretty much taught it to me. Okay. But not only that, but then 
You listen to what Elliot said, according to the witnesses that stood up in the preaching class, and you know what they said? They said, well, Elliot told us about going on YouTube and watching debates between oneness Pentecostals and Trinitarians, and he was telling people in church, oh, the oneness just destroyed the, the Trinitarians. That's where it came from. Elliot's online watching a bunch of oneness Pentecostal crap. And then they all get together and they feed off each other and, and, and they get all puffed up and vain in their fleshly minds and get this stuff. Oh, I got it from the Bible alone and my two buddies, one of whom was going around talking about watching oneness Pentecostals on YouTube debate the Trinity and win. Unbelievable, friend. Un be stinking leaveable that these guys would turn around and then say, it's not oneness. And that's what the guy who told me that said. He said, well, if it's not oneness, why are you bragging about the oneness guy winning a debate? No oneness guy ever won a debate on this. And if he did, somebody else needs to fill that Trinity slot. <laughs> Put a five-year-old in that Trinity slot who's got a few memory verses memorized. And look, I know, I know that there are probably some people because they're emotional about this, because they're friends with these people, can, who are, who are going to say, hey, you're being too harsh or you're too mean or you're overreacting and all this stuff. But, but let me tell you something. These people are my friends too. But you know what? I don't care. Because if my own friend says, come, let's go worship other gods, what does the Bible say? Your friend that's in your own bosom. You're the, supposed to be the first one to lay hands on him, and after that, all the rest of the congregation. So to sit there and say, oh, but these guys are our friends. No, 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 no. <laughs> if, if your friends are blaspheming and teaching heresy and trying to split the church, and that, look, that's what they were doing. They were telling people to move to Jacksonville, Florida. I thought it was all innocent. You all, look, did you all hear me a few weeks ago say, Hey, I think it's great if people want to move to Jacksonville and help them start the church. I think it's great. Did I discourage that at all? No way. You know why? Because I was naive. Because I thought it was innocent. You know, when you're innocent, you think other people are innocent. So I thought it was all so innocent. I'm just thinking like, yeah, great. You know, get him a running start. How can you not say that I did not love him and want to help him when I've done everything to, to try to promote him and be a blessing and try to get him off to a good start. Any of those people that were moving there could tell you that they came to me and told me that, and I said, great. Yeah. I didn't say a negative word about it. I said it was great. <laughs> but that's because I didn't know what was really going on, was that they were saying, well, you need to go to this Jacksonville church because it's going to be closer to the truth. Quote, closer to the truth than faithful word. First of all, it's not about being close to the truth. We're not close to the truth around here. We believe the truth around here. Amen. Amen. We're not just, you know, blindly trying. <laughs> you're getting warmer. You're getting warmer. Wait, uh, three or one. Okay, you're getting warmer. The goddess of the uh, fullness of the Godhead bodily. It, no, no, we already know what we believe on God. Yeah, right. Amen. We know who Jesus is. Right. We know the Trinity is a biblical doctrine. Amen. But to sit there and be on our payroll. Look, two different people, two different people called me and said this. They called the church phone number because they wanted to move to Phoenix, Arizona and join our church. They called to get information about housing and jobs. And you know what he told them? He told them the weather here is too hot. The economy is no good. You, should, you ought to go to Jacksonville. And both of them had decided to move to Jacksonville because he's on our payroll working for our church, answering our telephone, and like Absalom saying, no, 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 oh, no, no. David can't help you. <laughs> he's kissing them and hugging them. He's call and, and, and both of these guys told me he called them on a weekly basis just to check in, to say hi. Something I don't have time to do because I'm working. I'm working my butt off. I don't just, sorry, I don't go around and kiss every owie and kiss every person and, and be there for every moment in your life, all 350 of you. 
You know, I'm working for God. I have people that work for me to help me in the daily administration. But then Absalom, what did he say? Oh, you know, sorry, David doesn't have time for you, but I do. Come here. That's what's been going on. That's, look, that's devilish. That's nefarious. If you don't agree with the doctrines of our church, why are you on staff? Why are you answering the phone? Why are you calling these people back when they called us and telling them? And, and then look, this oneness doctrine was the tool that they were using to promote their new church over there. And just to make this crystal clear, because there are a whole bunch of people in Jacksonville that were all excited about them getting there. And there are a whole bunch of people who already moved there and were going to move there. And there are some people in our church and other churches who are still moving there because the wheels have already been set in motion. They had other reasons to go there. So don't get me wrong. Not everybody who was moving to Jacksonville was part of this. I just named the people who are part of it. I'm not protecting any of them. The people are Rick Martinez, Elliot Ray, Tyler Baker, and Russell Bobst. Those are the four bad guys here. And if I find out about anybody else that believes this crap, I'm going to throw you out of the church and name your name in front of everybody. Amen. He said, I don't like those tactics. Well, I don't like you coming into our church and teaching lies. And as the bishop and overseer of this flock, it's my job to protect from Judas. Amen. Coming in and creeping in with this junk. And a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition is rejected. That's right. And these guys have all had way more than that. And so there are other people who are still moving there for other reasons from other churches or, or they already got the job, they already bought the house, they sold the farm, they're already there. Or other people who are just in Jacksonville. Look, at first I felt the worst for them because they were the biggest victims here. And don't you dare make Tyler Baker a victim to me. Oh, we need to stop being so mean to Tyler. Why don't you shut up? I'm, we're the ones, Garrett and Brother Segor and I are the ones who had to put up with his lazy rear end. We're the victim. We're the ones who are getting trash talked by these people. We're the ones doing all the work while he sits on his butt in there just stroking everybody's ego while we do the real work around here. Go ask those two guys if I'm telling the truth. But I thought the real victims are the people over in Jacksonville. But you know what? I got good news for you. Brother Romero is sending his best guy, his right-hand man, Adam Fannin, to go found a church in Jacksonville, Florida on the same day that Brother Baker was going to start it. I, excuse me. I keep saying Brother Baker. I thought that he was probably saved, and I said on Wednesday night I still thought that he could be saved, but after watching his hour and 18-minute video, I don't believe that he's saved anymore. You know, that was the turning point for me where I believed that he was a total Judas. But I'll tell you right now, thank God for Brother Romero. And thank God for Brother Adam Fannin. Look, God works all things together for good. So don't get all down and depressed or discouraged. God allowed this to come out. He, it, I, we could have easily just accidentally sent him out if it weren't for the intervention of the Rodriguez's and the Madisons that brought this to us. Without that intervention, we could have accidentally sent this guy out and then we would have had, way more damage would have been done. Mm -hmm. God allowed this to come out at this time and I believe that it's all going to work together for good Amen. and that God's got a plan. And I believe that, you know, Adam Fannin is going to be the, is going to be great and that him coming to Jacksonville is a part of God's plan to use this all for his honor and glory. He's, he's from there originally, that region. He's got a lot of connections there. And, and I spent several hours with him. I like him. And he, he's not even on the payroll at Steadfast. He, he does more work than, than our guy was doing that was getting paid, Tyler Baker. So I'm pretty excited about that. And I'm just warning you, you know, don't you come to me with sympathy for the, for the devil. Go, go listen to your Rolling Stones or something, if that's what you believe in. <laughs> don't come to me with that sympathy for Judas. Oh, he cried. Yeah, you know who else cried? Esau, Judas Iscariot, and Bill Clinton. That's who else <laughs> cried. And self-pity, self-pity is not love. Just because somebody cries, it doesn't mean that they love you. 
I mean, yeah, of course he feels bad that he screwed up his life, lost everything, ruined a perfect opportunity, got busted, got caught. Of course. Of course you get cry when you get busted. Look, do your kids ever cry when they get busted and caught and then they go do the same thing another time? And, and I'm just, I want to make this real clear in case I haven't already. If you believe in this oneness, modalist junk, get out of this church. You're not welcome here. And if I find out that you believe in it, you're thrown out of the church as a heretic after the first and second admonition. And yeah, you're running a cult. No, actually, I'm running a church that would do the same thing that every church, every Bible-believing church, believes in the Trinity. Every single one. The cults are the oneness cults. Just go on non-Trinitarianism on Wikipedia and look at the list of people who believe in it. And if you say, well, you're talking about me. Good. And don't let the door hit you on the way out. Amen. Because this is not an optional doctrine in this church. Amen. You must believe in the Trinity to be a part of our church. We don't have to agree on everything. You can disagree with me on a bunch of doctrines. You can disagree with me on Bible prophecy. You can be pre-trib. You're welcome. Pre-tribbers are welcome. <laughs> But they're wrong. Yeah, exactly. But pre, look, let me make this clear. Pre-tribbers are welcome. Hey, I don't care if somebody says, hey, I believe that Israel is the greatest country in the Middle East right now. And I love Israel. And if the, if the U.S. doesn't support Israel, God's not going to bless them. Look, if you believe that, you're still welcome to come here. I mean, you, look, if you come here and you say, hey, I, I think rock and roll music is great, you can still come here. You can come to this church and say, I believe that Babylon is, is any city in the world. And you're welcome to come here. I'm serious. I mean, you look, you can come to this church and you can disagree with me on communion. You can disagree with me on breastfeeding. You can disagree with me on home birth. You can disagree with me on birth control. Go pump yourself full of birth control. But let me tell you something. You cannot come to our church and be a part of the body here if you disagree on salvation. And now, obviously, people that are brand, don't throw people out their first week for disagreeing on salvation because a lot of times people have to come for six, seven, eight, nine weeks and then they get salvation. But I'm talking about people who've heard and understood the truth and they're just like, no, I reject salvation by faith. Or I, re I reject the eternal security of the believer. Because obviously, look, we've had people that come and they give the wrong answer on salvation. They keep coming. You got to give people several months sometimes. It, sometimes it's, it takes a while for it to click with them. The, the seeds got to be watered. But look, if you're in disagree, if you're in just you're dead set on disagreeing on the gospel or on the King James Bible being the right Bible or on the deity of Christ or on the Trinity. I mean, these are not these are not optional. These are non-negotiables. And we need to understand the difference between non-negotiable fundamentals and other secondary doctrines. Right. And if anybody has any questions about this, feel free to come talk to me after the service. I'm not going to rip your head off. Okay, but if you come to me with this modalist crap and try to convince me of it, I will rip your head off. Because I'm not interested. I'm not interested in learning about modalism. Not interested in learning about oneness. I know what it is, and, I, and it's not allowed. So if that's a deal breaker for you, well, good, because it is for me too. Sounds like we're on the same page. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for uh, your word. And uh, we thank you so much for the truths that you've put in your word that make it so easy to, to uh, fight against these false doctrines, Lord. Thank you for making it clear for us. And Lord God, I pray that if there's anybody here who, who believes in this oneness Pentecostalism or modalism, Lord, I pray that they would leave our church and get out, Lord, if they are, are set on that heresy, Lord. But God, if anybody's on the fence, I pray that you would just open their eyes and show them the truth on this, Lord. And I just pray that your will would be done in this whole situation. And I'd also like to pray a special blessing upon uh, Brother Adam Fannin as he goes and stands in the gap in Jacksonville. And, and thank you for uh, Brother Romero uh, being available to, to step in at such a time as this, Lord. 
And we ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Song number 159. <clears throat> Blessed be the name. 